which is a uh, production of the Ink Kitchen Impression Show. Haynes and Hirsch are our sponsors. And uh, we have free seminars, if you want to call it that, or talks uh, all day long today and um, tomorrow. And uh, they'll be online. If you want to sign up for our email list, we'll let you know when they're up. And uh, very happy to have Bill Garvin here, who's very knowledgeable about embroidery. He runs a company called BG Tech Services, and he's going to talk about embroidery backing, which if you don't think is important, you should leave, because <laughs> it is. <laughs> Good Bill. morning, everybody. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. I'm here. Wake up. Okay. All right. Do y'all understand the differences between the different plastisol inks that are out there and available? Because I don't, and that's not what this class is about. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is your backing choices for an embroidery. Now I passed around some cards for you. Um, if you got additional questions after this, I hang out in the Ganola booth, uh, 939. Okay. And I'll hang out here for a little while. We can we can answer some questions. Um, so basic rules of backing, guys, is simply this, and this is what I live by. This is what I preach. This is the two basic rules, and I cannot explain backing simpler than this. You ready? If you embroider any material whatsoever that has any type of stretch to it, period, you have to use a cutaway backing. Simply because the material you're embroidering is not stable, therefore we need enough stabilizer, and backing is also referred to as what? Stabilizer, okay? Does that make sense? First rule, if it stretches, it has to be a cutaway backing. Second rule, pretty simple. If you embroider anything that is completely stable, it has no stretch to it whatsoever. Perfect example, hats and tote bags, right? A heavy canvas, buckram structured hats. We use tearaway backing on that. Cap backing, which is the poster board material on our hats, okay? So there's the two basic rules. If it stretches, cut away. If it's stable, tear away. You get it? Class over. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. We'll elaborate a little more. I passed out some cards for you, and you'll see that there's probably about 30 different samples of types of backing in there. I'm going to keep it simple for you. This is my 29th year of doing embroidery. My go-to backing, all points in time, if you're not sure what stabilizer you're supposed to be using, you're unclear, industry standard is 2.5 ounce cutaway backing. Cutaway. This is what you're going to be using probably 90% of the time. Well, you used to, because we're going to elaborate further about the crazy shirt that I'm wearing today. How many people are embroidering moisture wicking management materials? Fun, isn't it? No. All right, we all miss the days of 100% PK knit. They embroidered great. You throw some salvia on top of it to keep the stitches on top of the open weaves, but they embroidered great. They held up great, but these shirts, not so much, okay? So 2.5 ounce cutaway is your industry standard because almost anything we embroider in the apparel industry has some type of stretch to it. Make sense? Now I'm gonna tell you something I've done and I learned probably from about 1997 on. I have always used two sheets of 2.5 ounce cutaway, okay? And I, yeah, I'm talking about you spending 20 cents worth of backing instead of 10 cents worth of backing for you to make 10 bucks, boo hoo, I'm so sorry, okay? And the reason I learned this was simply because most of the things I embroider, I really only need that one sheet. It's stable enough. It looks great, it cleans up good. I get rid of my hoop burns. And by the way, don't use water for hoop burns. Spray starch. Never mildews the fabrics, gets rid of the hoop burns, you're good to go. Now the reason I use two layers of that cutaway backing is not for the production of what I'm sewing. It's for the wearability and washability down the road. How many of you have done a job you were proud of? You've seen the customer eight weeks later, you know they've worn that shirt three or four times, it's been washed, laundered, but more importantly it's been put into a dryer. And guess what polyester thread does when it dries again? It pulls in even tighter. Right? And you see that customer and you can't read the logo anymore because what's it do? Cups up. It'll pucker more. So again, I use the two sheets and spend the extra 10 cents for the quality of what I see that customer wearing down the road. Okay? About 1.8 ounce tearaway is pretty much the standard for your tearaway backing. There's two types of backing there. It's referred to as a firm and a crisp. Um, the firm 
is used for different things as far as that's completely stable. It works great for tote bags and stuff like that. When I'm on like linens and sheer see-through items that I need to use that tearaway on, I will normally use the crisp backing. Now the perfect example of crisp backing is also the cap backing. You ever notice how the cap backing, the poster board like material, it kind of breaks away during the embroidery process and comes off, okay? Now one other trick for that, when you're doing your hats. I try to cram in as much information as I can in 20 minutes here. If you want to be more successful on the unstructured hats, that's the ones with no buckram in them. All six panels or five panels are the same, floppy. Most people hate sewing those, I love sewing those. Always use two pieces of cap backing. Why? The material is not stable. We need it to be more stable, so we add some stabilizer to the process. Does that kind of make sense? and I'm way more successful on those type of hats. The only other thing I see people do wrong on those hats, you don't know how to adjust your frames correctly and you try to hoop and they're loose inside of there so no two ever sew exactly the same. Your frames are adjustable on every single piece of equipment out there. Make sure you adjust those frames the tightest they can go that when you lock it in place, the cap frame and the hat becomes one. If you adjust it completely out and it's still not tight enough, you know the cardboard that we always throw away? How many of you tried to embroider it? It actually works pretty good, doesn't it? It's not a stabilizer. It destroys needles, okay? So remember that. But you take that cardboard that's trash anyway, rip it in half, fold that piece in half, put it underneath the sweatband of the bill of that hat, and it adds the thickness you need around the teeth to make sure that hat is nice and tight. Make sense? That's the two tricks for your unstructured hats, and they'll sew better than any other hat you'll ever embroider, all right? Any questions on backing so far? Pretty simple and straightforward, isn't it? Now let's talk about Evil. Evil is the shirt that I'm wearing. Price of cotton went through the roof about 12 years ago. All of a sudden they come out with this moisture management wicking polyester material that pretty much everybody wears and you sell a lot of it now, right? So your industry standard used to be just your, your bonded backing, 2.5 ounce. Maybe you like the three, three and a half ounce and you use one sheet, that's fine. Another reason I use those two sheets, has anybody ever made a mistake on a shirt, wrong color? Never. Sewed it upside down? No, nobody does that, right? If you got a Peggy stitch eraser or a peanut, two sheets of backing makes it super easy to remove stitches out of a garment. So not only does it hold up for the wearability and washability, if you do make a boo-boo, which we do, it's a lot easier to take the stitches out with two pieces of backing without cutting through the shirt that you're doing. Now with that being said, no matter how careful you are removing stitches, Okay, you're always gonna have the holes, the penetrations from the needle of the last logo. So here's the trick. The trick is when you rehoop it, reapply backing, recenter it, make sure you increase the size of the design on the machine by 5%. X and Y. No customer you ever embroider for can see a 5% difference in a logo, but that'll guarantee it covers up any of the holes from the previous process. Make sense? All right, so I want to teach you two things about this. How much time I got left? 10 minutes? We need it. All right. So the shirt that I'm wearing right now, guys, okay, you wouldn't believe this, but it's a 4X. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm a big guy. I love to eat. All right. This, is, this material stretches four to five times its actual size. And I know this because when I did a presentation on this about four years ago, I wanted to see how far a medium could stretch. So I put it on. Wasn't pretty. Painted on shirt is what it looked like. My wife couldn't even get it off of me. It took a pair of scissors. But that's how far they stretch. I was able to actually get that shirt on. So that stretch is our problem doing embroidery. It's a super stretchy material. So instead of using a bonded backing in the, uh, it's, this, these are all in the things, but I'll pass around a couple of sheets. One on this side, there's one in black and one in white. Um, uh, there's one left on the table. Somebody wants to grab it real quick. If not, there's plenty in the booth. They're free, you can come by and help yourself. So those are in there, but I'll pass these sheets around so you have two in your hand, okay? So this is called Action Back. Now this is the product from Ganol, okay? Um, if you do Madeira, how many Madeira customers we got? Perfect, great company as well. They sell the products called Weblon. 
So those are your two you know, big supply companies. There's your two products. This is designed for our polyester stretchy materials. And the reason being, guys, is this. Instead of a bonded backing, a slurry, which is basically made just like paper, this is a woven. Has anybody ever embroidered medical scrubs? How do those sew? Amazing. They're stable, they're really tight, weaves, there's no open holes in it, they embroider beautiful. A lot of times you can get away with tear away on a small stitch count logo, send it out the door and it holds up forever. Uh, somebody ruined that industry a couple of years ago because they started making medical scrubs out of this material. Yeah, that person should have been shot behind the barn, okay? They ruined a perfectly good garment is what they did. So this material, the reason it works so good on the stretchy material is simply this. It has no stretch or elasticity left to right or top to bottom. However, it does have one flaw. It stretches diagonally. Now, truthfully, your suppliers are normally going to tell you that, yes, one sheet is all you need, and I couldn't agree more, okay? This will work better, and you will reduce your puckering by 40 or 50% on the shirt that I'm wearing, okay? But I'm telling you, you can reduce it even more because my preference is to use two sheets, and you turn one basically at a 45-degree angle. I even go one step further. If it's a crazy thin shirt, um, the real cheap ones, well, I shouldn't say cheap. So Nike is expensive, right? Reebok's expensive. The Adidas ones are expensive, but they always seem to be a much thinner material. So the thinner the material is, the more it's going to stretch. I'll even create what's called a backing sandwich. I'll use these two sheets and I'll put a piece of my bonded two and a half ounce in between it. And it helps reduce the puckering even a little more. So it's not right or wrong. Now I'm gonna warn you, and this is pretty honest. This is a specialty backing. Does anybody know what the word specialty means in any industry? Expensive. It costs a whole lot more money. Instead of 10 cents worth of backing, and I'm talking customers with single heads running a 40 hour production week job, you're gonna be paying about 25 cents a sheet for this stuff, okay? That's expensive. But the truth is, I tell my customers, instead of a jersey knit 50-50 two-button polo that cost me $3, I sell it for $7, I'm using 20, 30 cents worth of material as far as consumables, because it's only backing, bobbin, and thread, okay? On this type of shirts, they cost a lot more, don't they? You sell them for a lot more, don't you? Your profit margin is a lot higher, isn't it? So do you think I really care about spending 60 or 70 cents worth of product? if I'm making three times the amount of money on the product, to first give my customer a better product that holds up better over time. Okay, it's called repeat business. How many people in here advertise in the embroidery business? Two of you, three of you, that's impressive. Normally I can ask that upstairs in the seminar with 100 people and they all say no, because our biggest business is always what? repeat business and your repeat business tells everybody else and before you know it you don't sleep much at night you got to buy more machines and hire people to help you so be careful what you wish for make sense now i'm going to tell you something else nobody's ever told you unless you've been to one of these workshops or seminars or shop talks with me there's one other thing you can do to reduce the puckering on this shirt besides the backing guys okay and it's in your software on your computer. Do you ever notice if you get something custom digitized, sent in, it's a 12,000 stitch logo, it's the American flag, and underneath it's got a tagline in small text, and it sews really well, and it doesn't pucker too bad. But in your software, you have to do these name drops over here on all those polos for that company, don't you? Your typeset, and I don't care which software you own, you're doing typeset. Lettering's the only thing you have to do well in-house, in your shop. That starts to add up very quickly. Um, and then the you're going to do a 50% deposit, you. typically, Here's the um, way that for you when you get it originally made and done all the work for is essentially useless. So that's the reason that you have to go through and when you just make that fee again. Then your, then your actual physical sample. If you're doing one, it's going to be right around $75 to $125 for the sample. Stitches in it. Does anybody know why it does that? And you use the same amount of backing. You use the same exact hoop. 
and it puckered more, and it's only got 800 to 1,000 stitches in it. This was 12,000 stitches. It has to do with the width of the stitch. All embroidery pulls on the machine the way a stitch is created. Guys, the wider the stitch becomes, the more it pulls. So this is much bolder, wider satin stitches. Your software will normally default on a three quarter inch letter to either a zigzag or a double zigzag underlay. Y'all understand, you've seen this in your software. You can change it to an edge walk, you can change it to a center walk underlay. Guys, that zigzag or double zigzag actually makes the puckering worse because it's additional wide satin stitches in it and all of those stitches are doing what? Pulling it in even tighter. Make sense? So here's, I'm gonna tell you something you never thought to do. On that lettering, change your underlay to a parallel to Tommy or Phil. It's all the same stitch. Whatever your software is telling it, at, tell, at, or as, calls it in your software. For example, I use Wilcom a lot when I digitize for my clients and everybody. And there, it's called a tatami. I leave my density at 3.0 instead of the 0.4, so it's a very light density. Guys, what that is is simply this. Before it sews the letter, it comes through with a series of short stitches. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Guys, the purpose of underlay in any logo is pretty simple. It exists for one reason. Underlay's job is to tack any material that you are embroidering to the stabilizer to reduce the amount of push and pull in the logo. It adds no more stitches to your design. It will reduce the puckering on that lettering 40 or 50 percent and then you add this, you're going to reduce the puckering on that logo changing the backing and that underlay property as much as 90% on these type of shirts. You will start turning out a far better product than you have before, okay? Now there's other samples inside of there. You'll notice there's some solvies, there's some heat aways, okay? This isn't backing. Um, on towels, believe it or not, I actually do use a solvie as a backing. Most of the time, solvie is used on top of materials, okay? And it's designed to just simply keep the the stitches on top of the knit of the fabric so they can't fall into the holes. How many people in here use Solvi on a polyester shirt? If you notice, a couple people raise their hands. Believe it or not, there's actually a lot of shirts and materials that actually need Solvi and you can get a far better product in result by doing it. If you're not sure, it's simple. You're the professional embroiderer. Luckily, 95% of everything you embroider for everybody, they don't know what it's actually supposed to look like. They're just like, oh my God, it looks so good. And you've been sweating for three days and did four sew outs trying to make it better. Make sense? Okay. If you're not sure if it needs solving or not, it's simple. You sew one width and you sew one width out. And if you can clearly see, see a difference, guess what you should be doing? Solvy. There's also a heat away in there. Most people don't know that there's a heat away type of solvy material. It doesn't dissolve. It did, literally turns to ash by heat, iron or heat press. That material is designed for whenever you're doing anything that's not designed to get wet, like cashmere products, sweaters, and things like that. They're not supposed to get wet. Okay? Guys, I hope you enjoyed that today. Thank you very much. All right, and Bill's going to hang around for a couple minutes on the side here if you have questions for him. Until he kicks me out. Yes. Thanks for coming. <laughs>